Well, the takeaway from Everest uh, turned out to be not at all what I expected. I you know, was pursuing the Seven Summits quest, which is to climb the tallest mountain on each of the seven continents. Uh, I got that idea from Dick Bass, uh, who was an irrepressible soul, and had basically pursued that and leaving Everest for number seven. And I thought that I would go and enjoy uh, the climb, a, a unique culture. Uh, but what I got instead was an, a serious wake-up call. It's pretty much like uh, if you can't learn something from dying, then you are definitely a slow learner. I'd always been fairly obsessed with work, with training for mountains, and those kinds of behaviors make you very successful, but they also do not leave a lot for the people in your life. And as a result, uh, those that had alienated uh, my wife Peach and estranged me somewhat from my kids. Uh, and so I came back from Everest with no other choice other than to change my life. Uh, and fortunately, doing so uh, has given me a real sense of peace and allowed me to reconnect uh, with Peach. And we're now just like a pair of old shoes uh, growing old together comfortably. Well, the name of our book is Left for Dead because I was left for dead at least three times. Uh, and you know, I can truthfully say that I've gone through the entire experience of dying. The only thing that was lacking was the final stoppage of the heart. When I was out on the ice in the storm, I was unconscious in hypothermic coma for 15 hours. And so why I woke up, I don't uh, truly know. But they... And while we were in the huddle, uh, they rescued the uh, three fisher climbers and left the two hall climbers. So that was left for dead one. They came out the following morning to look at my body and Yasko Namba's body. And once again, even though we were still breathing, uh, they reported us as being dead uh, because everybody knows that once you go into hypothermic coma, you always die. So that was number two. <laughs> uh, and then finally, when I managed rather miraculously to get back to uh, camp, they still knew I was going to die uh, and did not plan to bring me down, but placed me in a tent alone so I could finish uh, the work that needed to be done. Left for dead number three. <laughs> I actually knew that I was dead because even when I woke up, I remember very distinctly that the sun was 15 degrees above the horizon and setting. And of course, it moves 15 degrees an hour. And once it became dark, that nobody has survived two nights out on Everest. So at that point, it would be all over. Uh, and I knew that I was dead. And that's a very interesting <laughs> thing to come to grips with. Uh, and it really was uh, not particularly frightening, but it was uh, a sense of real melancholy because of what you would miss. Uh, and it sounds uh, a little unusual or, I don't know, even fantastic, but the thing that kept me going was I could see in my mind's eye my wife and my children, and that is what drove me to keep moving even when I had stumbled one more time and didn't think I could even get up again. Well, if I were to ask you to believe and truly believe that an hour from now you'd be dead, what are you going to think about? It certainly is not going to be any material, physical uh, thing. It's going to be the people that you really care about because that's at the end is what truly is important in your life. And so it was not at all surprising that when I truly believed that I was dead, that that's, those were my last thoughts. Well, obviously I've got some interesting challenges uh, physically. Uh, I was very fortunate that I was able to be strong enough to get back to Dallas, back to Medical City, uh, because getting medical care was real high on my list of things to do. And one of the things you want to be able to do is access uh, world-class facilities. And I had, uh, fortunately, uh, in my doctors, Greg Anigan, uh, Mike Doyle, and Joe Sample, 
some superb physicians. And so Mike Doyle did civil wars on my right side. So this is just a straight, ordinary amputation. So if you could use a prosthetic, uh, which I don't use, but it was a good idea at the time. On the other side, I've got Star Wars, because this is very fancy microvascular uh, surgery with whole moving pieces of my head and my back in, onto my hand, uh, which was largely dead. And so we, we recreated a mitt, uh, and all of my function is in that half of my little thumb right there, and that allows me to do pretty much anything anybody else does. I work, I drive, um, you know, go on the internet, everything that you do in your normal day-to-day -day life, I do. The other big issue was that I had destroyed the middle of my face. And you're not really very attractive if you just have a hole in the middle of your face. I had to tie a pork chop around my neck to get the dog to play with me. <laughs> so it was not, not a great time. Uh, and you'd go, before I got reconstructed, you'd go out to a mall or something and little kids would come running by and just stop like they'd seen an alien, uh, a real uh, honest evaluation of what you get from children. And so they grew a nose upside down on my forehead and after some months of cultivating my upside down nose they swung it down put it on the middle of my face and they I think they did a pretty good job I mean it's that I, I wasn't handsome before I'm not handsome now but you know I calls myself improving uh, and so that was a, a, a big event Actually, the nose got to be fairly famous. Uh, my nose was asked to be on the Oprah show. And so I got to accompany uh, the nose to Chicago. <laughs> and Greg Anigan, who did that surgery as well, was so jealous that I now have to give my nose to him for a uh, month in the summer and every other weekend. <laughs> Our movie very much follows that lead. Uh, I think it would be asking way too much of a Hollywood screenwriter given the opportunity to create a personality for a conservative Texan not to enjoy some of that moment. Uh, so the, the character starts off being a bit of a jerk uh, and then actually he gets more human as the movie progresses. But in it, you know, initially it's, uh, it was a little jarring uh, because the character says things that just wouldn't even occur to me to say. Uh, but as I thought about it, I said, figured, well, at least for one period of my time, I'm going to be devilishly handsome and I'm married to Robin Wright. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll accept that. Well, the basic character hadn't changed. Uh, I've always been outgoing and friendly and like everybody that I meet unless they give me some reason not to. But I always in the past lived in the future. That was the nature of how I uh, conducted everything. I'd set a goal, I'd pursue the goal, achieve the goal, set another goal. And just constantly uh, making that circle, which means that you're always living in the future, which never arrives. And so now I really don't do that so much anymore. I live in the today, the present. I enjoy my new grandbaby. Uh, and it's a lot more peaceful. And it's, you know, life is just simply better when you get to the point where you can live comfortably in your own skin and not try to define yourself by achievements alone. I had to learn to do it because Peach gave me no choice. When we got back, she told me that uh, she decided to divorce me while I was on the mountain. She'd had just enough of my adventuresome uh, spirit and wasn't going to tell me that until I got back to Dallas. And the day that I walked in, she told me. And I understood. And I told her that I would never blame her for that. And I, you know, I could understand how she would feel that way and, you know, I would support whatever decision she would make. And she said, well, no, uh, damn you, you got one year. You proved to me that you're a different person and your priorities are different, right? And that what is important to you in your life is your family and the people around you. And at that point, I knew that there are a lot of struggles I've had, and, and that was the most vital that I've ever done. Well, uh, we're still together. We are, it's a testimony uh, to sheer stubbornness, Peach and I both. <laughs>
<laughs> it was one of those things. If you want a divorce, you got to do it. I'm not going to divorce you. I love you, you know. <laughs> but one of the things that is so true, though, is that you can love somebody immeasurably, and it's just not enough because you got to be there for them. And if you're not there, you force them to make a life for themselves without you. And even though you may believe at some point you'll slow down and, you know, you'll always say, ta-da, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm back. Uh, at that point, they've had to move on because they have no alternative. And because of Everest, uh, I had to change my uh, priorities and it's worked. Life is good. <laughs>